Now let's look at some of the beneficial things that are out there. Uh, getting to know the insects. That's not a Photoshop slide. That's an actual child with an actual caterpillar on their nose. My kids grew up unafraid of bugs. We need to know whether a bug is helping us or hurting us out in the garden. Uh, we get calls at the extension office like, there's a bug on my tomato. What kind of bug? What's it doing? Maybe it was flying across the yard and stopped to rest a minute and now it's going to fly on. Is it a pest of the tomato? Probably not. Uh, but knowing bugs that are good, bugs that are bad, and what they look like when they're eggs and larvae and nymphs and adults at all the stages of their life is important if you're going to be an organic gardener in order to know whether something's out there working for you or not. So this top picture, those little flattened things along the stem of that plant, and those little spider-like orange things crawling around, that's the tomato, or the leaf-footed bug on tomato. You know the leaf-footed bugs, they put their mouth in your tomato and spit and suck up the contents, and then move over and spit in another spot, and they leave those little hard yellow spots on your tomato. You can share that with your friends next time you serve them tomatoes, explain what those little hard yellow spots are. It's one of the unpleasant things about horticulture that we, we need to learn. Like, for example, bees go to the flower and get nectar, and then they come back and make honey, but how do they get it back to the flower? There's only one way into an organism, and there's two ways out of an organism, and neither one of them is very pleasant to think about. So before you eat honey, you might want to Google that and find out which end of the bee is that coming out of. That's another thing. How about on the bottom left, those little yellow things that are kind of oblong, that look like they're sticking in, maybe feeding on that leaf. See the aphids around them, the chartreuse green aphids, and then the little yellow things. Those little yellow things are lady bee legs. So if you saw a few aphids, and some lady bee legs, that's not a time to spray, that's a time to sit back because you're fixing to have the aphids cleaned up for you when those things hatch out. The other one is harlequin bugs hatching out from those little white and black striped eggs. And if you just have a few cold crop plants, you can turn your leaves over once a week or so, and when you find a cluster of eggs like that, you know what they are, you just smash them with a thumb and forefinger and you're done. If you let stink bugs and harlequin bugs grow up and get wings and start flying around, they're a lot harder to control, and there's not a good organic control anymore for those. So good bugs and bad bugs. We have good bugs, like true, true bugs. Remember from entomology, we call, some people call all insects bugs. Well, bugs are the hemiptera, and the pirate bug, the assassin bug, the wheel bug, the spine stilt bug, they all are bugs that feed on other insects. They use their mouth part to suck the juices out of them. There's the big-eyed bug, which sucks the juice out of an egg, an insect egg sitting on the leaf, or the, another kind of assassin bug, or a predatory type of stink bug. And good bugs tend to have short, stubby mouth parts because they're going to put their mouth in something that's going to jerk and twist and try to run away. And so they need a good, strong mouth part. Bad bugs tend to have long, slender mouth parts, like a hypodermic needle, because they're going to put them down in your plant part and suck the juices out. And so that's one way to tell them apart. But, but the other way is to get some good books, do some online searches, because all these pictures are from Texas. These are all things that live in your yard, my yard, uh, and are helping us out. There's wasps. Uh, paper wasps eat primarily caterpillars. That's their favorite food. Uh, they fly around that webworm nest trying to find a way in. Uh, there's uh, the potter wasp, which is a, one of the types of mud daubers. It makes the little round marble-sized uh, homes for its young that look like a little piece of pottery in this picture in the bottom center. That potter wasp had gathered all those looper caterpillars and shoved it inside there and sealed it up with an egg so that its baby would be born in a cafeteria. Now, had I killed that beneficial insect with a spray, a grenade, I would have inherited the job of controlling <coughs> cabbage loopers in my, in my vegetables. And so we want to avoid doing damage to those ones that are out there helping us. They've, they've estimated that a large paper wasp nest will consume about 2,000 caterpillars in a year. That's a lot of caterpillar control uh, from one nest. 
My favorite wasps are the small ones. Uh, the Encarsia wasp is very tiny. Uh, the, the, uh, it lays its egg in eggs. That one on the far left is a trichogramma wasp sitting on a caterpillar egg. That egg is smaller than a BB. So that is a tiny little wasp that lays an egg inside that caterpillar egg and it'll never hatch out. The braconid wasp, this one's cool, it lays its egg inside the hornworm body and the eggs all hatch out into larvae that crawl through the body of the hornworm and then they go to the skin and eat a hole and make a little pupil case on the skin out of which a wasp will come out. Now that's a bad day to be a hornworm. It's not a good thing. Speaking of a bad day, a bad day to be an aphid is when a parasitoid wasp comes up and brings its rear end underneath its body forward and lays an egg in you by just popping you like that with its rear end. And then, have you seen the movie Alien? Remember that guy at dinner that wasn't feeling real good and things went from bad to worse? That's what happens. Uh, the aphid, we'll call him Joey, one day Joey doesn't feel real good and he starts to get kind of puffy and look a little bit tanned colored in it instead of pink or green or whatever kind of aphid Joey is. And the next thing you know, he becomes a dead mummy and out of the back end of Joey comes crawling a wasp that flies around and does it again. All those aphids in the lower right uh, have a little trap door on the back because a wasp came out of them. That's, and you've got this going on in your garden uh, here in Texas. They're, they're very prevalent. And that, that aphid will never grow up. It'll just become a place for the wasp to grow up in. So do you see those tan sesame seed looking aphids on the leaf? Each of those has a wasp inside. So if you saw that on your plant, and I, I took this with a, with a, um, a camera phone. You, you, can, uh, you, you can go out in your garden and actually see this happen if you sit still and watch. Uh, when you see this happening, you don't need to spray for aphids. You've got things under control. Beneficials need food. If they don't have food, they won't stick around. So we need a few pests in order to keep them around. There's beneficial beetles. You've already seen it, yes. I worked in Austin for a while. And you see a lot of weird things. The, the campaign to keep Austin weird is unnecessary. It's in no danger of ceasing to be weird. That one had Christmas lights on it and I had to take a picture. Ground beetles run along the ground and eat eggs and larvae and things like that. Uh, lady beetles, all of those in the top right are all lady beetles. Even those two little small ones, the brown small ones, those are lady beetles. Those are dusky lady beetles or skimness beetles. I'll show you what their larvae look like in a moment. Lady beetles lay eggs that typically are little elongated yellow waxy footballs on a leaf that hatch out into larvae that look like little alligators dressed up for Halloween with orange and black. And they eat about 300 aphids in their lifetime. And then they become pupa, which are stationary. And then out of the pupa comes the adult. And so learning your beneficials in all their life stages is important if you're gonna be an organic gardener because they're your main helpers out there in the garden. This is a, a skimness lady beetle, and it, it's a long, it's a larva, and the, the way that you identify that, if you looked at that, you might say, that looks like a mealybug to me. But mealybugs are cottony tufted, uh, just little, just like a bunch of messy cotton. These have like white dreadlocks coming out, like, like little matted, see those long things coming off of the beetle? That, that's the best way I can describe it, and it, it, it's the way to identify those little things. So when you see something crawling around like that, that's not a mealybug, that's a, that's a lady beetle. And by the way, do you see the parasitized aphid on that leaf? You learning to look for those? That, that one with the wasp inside? That's what these look like. Flies, we have beneficial flies. Surfed flies, also called hoverflies, because they fly like a hummingbird. They hover over the flowers and, and sit there in midair and then they move over and stop in midair. Uh, they have larvae that eat aphids. Their pupa look like little waxy tan teardrops on a leaf. We also in our gardens have lace wings that lay little eggs on strands of silk. If you see a little quarter inch long strand, hair like strand with a ball on the end, a white ball, that's a lace wing egg. Uh, their larvae also eat aphids get to watch one. If this had sound, you'd hear, ah. 
as these aphid just gets eaten alive. See all the aphid bodies laying around where that thing has been eating them? Uh, they're munching on aphids all the time. They're out there working for you in the gardens. There are spiders that are good. Uh, every spider is a beneficial insect. There's two species in Texas primarily that we worry about, the brown recluse and the black widow that hurt us, but the rest of them are all beneficial insects. Some make webs to catch bugs. Some, like the green link spider, run around and grab stuff and haul it back to the nest. There's also mites. Have you ever learned to check for spider mites by putting a white piece of paper under a leaf and thumping it? And the mites will fall down on the leaf, or on, uh, on the paper, and you'll see these little pepper flake reddish things crawling around really slow. That's how you check for spider mites. When you see something running about 10 times as fast as a spider mite, that's a, a predatory mite. Here's one that's going to run past that two-spotted spider mite. For some reason, that one didn't catch his attention. Then he grabs another one and starts to eat on it. They just chase them down and eat them. And this keeps our mites under... You can buy predatory mites in greenhouses. They, they release them uh, to control mites on their crops. There's another one munching on, on an aphid. Beneficial critter, critters like snakes and toads and anoles. Does everybody have anoles at their house? Do you know that if you tap them, they'll open their mouth and you can make earrings out of them? <laughs> My wife hates reptiles, hates, detests reptiles. Oldest daughter comes in, Mom, look, and right then that darn anole let go, hit the ground, and ran underneath the couch that I got to sleep on that night. <laughs> Anoles eat bugs. Biological control comes after the pests are arrived. You don't have an outbreak of lady beetles in a pest-free landscape. There's no reason for them to be there. They'll starve to death. They're not going to lay eggs for their babies to starve. So when you start to see pests, then you get beneficials. And when you get enough beneficials, the pest population starts to fall down. And then when there's nothing to eat, the beneficial population goes down. So nature's not balanced. It's forever imbalanced, trying to rebalance itself. But our goal is to try to keep it as close to balance as we can. And so if you go in and nuke everything and kill everything, you're not going to get a beneficial outbreak. You, your first thing would be a pest outbreak. And then in time, beneficials would come in.